Now, I <coughs> say I explained the general framework <coughs> of algebraic quantum field theory. I tried to motivate the axioms, and I also described certain consequences of the axioms. But one problem was not treated up to now, namely how to specify a given model. Actually, this is some problem which was uh, always uh, not uh, maybe neglected or not sufficiently well uh, treated in axiomatic quantum field theory for several reasons. And uh, I will present some new ideas on this uh, problem. So uh, let's start with a Lagrangian of a classical field theory. And uh, I concentrate here also on the following on the theory of scalar field phi. Of course, most of this can be generalized, but there are new problems in gauge theories. And I think next week, Alexander Schenkel will explain what one can do in case of gauge theories. So here I will concentrate on a scalar field. Now the first thing is that one looks at the space of field configuration, which is assumed to be the uh, just the space of smooth functions on your space time. If you think of the of the path integral, you might be surprised because on the path integral, it's not sufficient to treat only the smooth field configurations. Actually, in cases you understand the path integral mathematically, you know that the smooth configurations form a set of measure zero. But here in this framework, it's really sufficient to look at the smooth configuration, which is important for the formulas. Now, the starting point is the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is the density defined on the jet space of the field. They assume that it has this simple form written there, so we have some space-time metric. Um, some space-time metric G. And we take the inverse metric applied to the cotangent space. So here it's a differential of the field phi. And we have some uh, self-interaction of the field, which is described by a certain function v, usually a polynomial, but not necessarily. And here d mu g is just the density induced by the space time metric. Now, to treat this in, uh, in quantum field theory, the standard procedure is canonical quantization. So you use the foliation of your space-time by Cauchy surfaces, which says that you write your space-time as a product of the real numbers times some other manifold sigma. And the metric then can be presented in this form, g of tx, where t is a uh, coordinate in r, and x is a coordinate on sigma. And this is just this a squared dt squared, where a is a positive function, minus the Riemannian metric on sigma, and this Riemannian metric uh, can depend on time. So this is uh, for all globally hyperbolic space times possible to write them in this form. Now, the uh, special, uh, we restrict everything to some of these uh, Cauchy surfaces, sigma. So we write the Lagrangian as uh, density on the on the uh, on sigma times dt. We look at the normal derivative with respect to this Cauchy surface, which is a to the minus one times the time derivative of phi. Then we define the canonical momentum pi as the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the to this normal derivative of phi. And this gives just the time derivative of phi multiplied by the density induced by the metric on the Riemann surface sigma, on the Riemannian space sigma. This is a canonical momentum. Then you have canonical commutation relations, phi 
at time t at uh, space point x. This commutator with pi of at the same time with a different point gives just a Dirac measure. Actually, I omitted here a factor i. Okay, so uh, what is uh, important to note here is that this canonical commutation relation does not depend on the metric on sigma, so it's in particular not time dependent, which means that the algebraic structure is independent of the time, on the time variable. And then you look at the time evolution described by the Heisenberg equation, just takes this form, so you take the commutator of the Hamiltonian density defined below as pi phi dot minus L. This is A of T, the A is just some observable, some function of phi and pi at a given time T, and the time evolution is then given by this equation. And uh, I think it's, um, one should also see that here it's important to do the commutator before you do the integral over X because otherwise you might have uh, problems with convergence of the whole thing if sigma is not a compact manifold. Okay, so this is the formalism of canonical quantization, and it's, of course, very elegant, but the problem is if you really want to uh, do, uh, do it rigorously in the mathematical sense, you run into problems. And the problems come from the fact that here, this is not a number, but it's a distribution. And as long as you have linear functions of phi and pi, this is uh, harmless because we know how to treat distributions. But for distributions, it's uh, always a problem when you try to multiply them pointwise. Then you run into problems and once the square of the delta function is not well defined. And so, so when you try to do this canonical quantization rigorously, you uh, meet a lot of, lot of problems. They are, uh, depend on the dimensions, on two dimensions, these problems are relatively harmless and can be uh, to some extent solved, but in higher dimensions they are really ugly. Now I want to try to reformulate this process of canonical quantization by deriving certain formulas in this framework of canonical quantization, which remain meaningful also when you, uh, um, when the original formulation of canonical quantization becomes ill-behaved. So we look at a additional interaction described by some local functional, which is just the functional of phi, and it's of this form that uh, there is some function uh, of the field and, in addition, some explicit dependence on time and space. This I call a local functional. Here, in principle, one could admit also derivatives of phi, but this creates problems also um, I will assume for this talk that uh, this uh, function f depends only on the field itself, not on the derivatives. Furthermore, I assume in order to have well-defined integrals that f vanishes outside of some compact region, which is called the support of the functional. So support means support in the sense of functionals, not in the sense of functions. So it's uh, like it for distributions, when you have the support of a distribution, you don't look at this as a map, but as a functional. So it's a support of, of F in the variables T and X, which is a support of capital F. Now we uh, th uh, consider this as an interaction. We operate on the system by this interaction, this produces a certain S matrix, which I call S of F. And uh, there's a nice formula, the Dyson series, which tells us how to compute S of F. 
namely this is this infinite sum where you have time ordered integrals of this uh, interaction density here. So the integral is over space and time, but in time you know, there is this restriction that the time arguments have to be ordered. And the phi which you insert here must be a solution of the Heisenberg equation for the Hamiltonian derived from the original Lagrangian. So this is the general formula coming from the uh, previous expression of from canonical quantization. So now um, there is a nice formula due to Bogle Yubov how to construct the interacting field when you add to the Lagrangian this additional interaction f. Namely, you can split this uh, functional capital F into two parts. One describes the interaction before the time t and the other the interaction after the time t. And so this is just the, the uh, integral over F but with restriction of the time variable. Now then this S matrix factorizes in the interaction after the time t and the interaction before the time t. Yeah, this is, uh, perhaps one should look at this formula here. So when you have some time t, then this time t is somewhere between these variables t1 to tn. So there are n plus 1 possibilities to put the t here. So you get n summons and you make this split in, uh, uh, for given t. And this corresponds directly to the expression when you get, when you insert the power series for the first factor and the second factor. Yeah? Then you multiply power series and you, in each order you get a sum of n plus one terms corresponding just to this uh, different possibility for t lying between the other time arguments. Okay, then the Bogolyubo formula says the following. You add now to your interaction capital F the f multi uh, multiple of the field itself, which is also a valid interaction. And then you take the derivative with respect to lambda at lambda equals zero. And this is now the interacting field. Why? Now, if you use this factorization described here, you see the first term, the interaction after the time t, plays no role. So this cancels. And so what remains is just the interaction up to the time t. And when you look at this formula, you see that this new field, this whole expression, fulfills the uh, Heisenberg equation for the new interaction. So where you add to the original interaction, the interaction coming from the functional capital F. The nice feature of this formula is that on the left hand side, you don't need to split into space and time. So this formula remain, uh, does not know which uh, foliation by Cauchy surfaces you have done. So before yeah, we really needed this uh, foliation to find meaningful expression, but here we get already an expression which does not involve this split. Now we can then, of course, instead of the field itself, one can also look at uh, functions of phi, products and so on. Uh, and one can also form now uh, a new S matrix defined by some local functional capital G, which acts in addition to the time evolution coming from the Lagrangian L plus, plus the uh, interaction F. And just from this formula, you see, you get a easy formula for, the, for this new S matrix which is just this expression. So you have S of F to the minus one times S of F plus G. So the formula for the S matrix is even simpler than the formula for the interacting field. So this is now the 
S matrix in the interrupting theory for an additional interruption capital G. And again, <coughs> yeah? Uh, I haven't understood uh, how you get this formula as F of G or what it is even. But, uh, this, what is F of G? This formula? Yeah, what, what is F as F of G even by definition? Oh, this is the right hand side. This is the definition, the right hand side. Of it. Okay. This is a definition, but it but it has the interpretation of the interaction, the S matrix induced by G on in a theory which has a Lagrangian L plus F. Yeah. So so so, um, so here you could this you could call the field under the interaction capital F. Yeah, this formula here. And then with this interrupting field, you can form again the S matrix. So you use just the same formula as before. The only difference is that the, your field evolves not to the, uh, according to the Lagrangian L, but to the Lagrangian L plus F. It's exact, yeah, you do just the same as you did before, and this gives this simple formula. Yeah, this is. Uh, the definition you say no. Uh, no, no, the uh, definition you say or what? Okay. Uh, it's you can consider it as a definition, but it's just say uh, what you get you you could also say, well, I, this is my interacting field. This I call now phi index F. This field. This this whole expression here. This is the new the new field. And this is a field satisfying the Heisenberg equation for the Hamiltonian coming from from this Lagrangian. Then you do it, use exactly the same formula as before. This formula, but now you insert for phi the phi index f. Yeah, and this and, and for the f you insert some function g. Yeah, you, so, so you define S index F of G. Here you have some G. And the phi itself is now the phi under the interaction F. But it's exactly the same formula, just for new Lagrangian. Yeah? So in this sense, it's not a definition, it's a result, yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and this uh, then for the same reason as before, these um, these S matrix S F of G can can be split in the same way. Yeah, if you split now the interaction capital G into two parts. Okay, now we can rewrite this factorization rule in the following form. Then we have S of Two, three interactions, F plus G plus H. This can be factorized in the following form, provided the support F and the support of H can be separated by a Cauchy surface so that support F is in the future and support H is in the past of, some Cauchy, of this Cauchy surface. Namely, if you use this Split by the Cauchy surface. Yeah, then you you uh, add this index t, and you see f is after the time t. G can be split, and h is uh, at earlier times. So you can split the left hand side to two parts. Then you can do the same for each factor here, and you see that these uh, contributions. Uh, here you have the, the part of G uh, at times uh, smaller than T. Here you have the time, uh, part of G um, at times uh, later than T. And here this you can also split and at the end all these terms cancel and you uh, get the same expression and then on the left hand side. 
So this is a very nice formula because now this formula is completely independent of the splitting into space and time. Yes, it does not know the splitting of space and time which you use. For any Cauchy surface which uh, satisfies this condition, you get this formula. Now this is a, a so-called causal factorization which plays an important role. And um, but this holds for any theory, any theories which is local and so satisfies the rules of causality. In particular, uh, you see also one thing, namely if f and g are space-like to each other, then there are two Cauchy surfaces, one such that support f is in the future and support h in the past, and there's another Cauchy surface with the opposite direction, so you get both orders. And from this you can uh, get that uh, uh, observables at um, space-like separation commute with each other. So this is a consequence of this factorization rule. Okay. Now, how can we specify the dynamics? So uh, this can be done in the following way. So we can shift our field configuration phi by adding another smooth function, psi, which is fixed. And uh, here I take now a function with compact support. Now, uh, but this is just a relabeling of my, my configuration space. So then I do the same relabeling for the Lagrangian, so I add to the fields in the Lagrangian just the, the this additional test function psi, I get an isomorphic theory. But now I can also look at the difference between the shifted Lagrangian and the original one and treat this as an interaction. This moves me back to the original theory, and what I get is an automorphism of the original theory, which is just given by this formula. So alpha is this automorphism applied to this S matrix S of F according to this formula we had before. The, now delta L of psi is the interaction, so we have the, the inverse, and then we have the interaction plus the uh, F, but now shifted by psi. Yeah, so this is uh, the uh, so structure which you get just from the fact that you can do this transformation and you can redo this by treating this as an interaction. For this to be uh, meaningful, it is important that psi has compact support because then this integral exists. Now assume that you have uh, so support psi is somewhere. Uh, is compact, so it's, say it's in the future of some Cauchy surface and support F is in the past of some Cauchy surface. Then we apply this rule of causal factorization and we see the, this factor can be split into a factor involving only the delta L of Psi times S of F involving the shifted uh, functional F but the shift is completely irrelevant because psi has a disjoint support from f. So uh, the, the uh, functional f does not see the psi. So you see for such f's, this, this automorphism is actually trivial. Okay, you get the, the, the interaction part uh, cancels and the f does not change under this transformation. Now we use the time slice axiom. So we, we have an automorphism which acts trivial for all functionals which have support in the path of some Cauchy surface. So this is a region which certainly contains other Cauchy surfaces. So by the time slice axiom, this is a full algebra, which means 
that actually this automorphism is an identity. So we find a certain identity in the uh, in the theory. And we can try to uh, understand it a little bit more, namely we use now for our functional f just this shift in the Lagrangian for another test function psi prime. We insert this in the formula, we bring the S of delta L psi to the other side, get a product, and for the right hand side we compute this expression with me here. So we have to form this sum, so this is the delta L of psi, and here we have would have the delta L of psi prime shifted by psi. But when you add these two terms, you get just the shift, uh, the, the data L with the shift psi plus psi prime. So you have a group law for these, uh, these, uh, um, these operators. And in particular, you can look at the one parameter group. If you multiply psi by, by some uh, uh, real number lambda, and you can look at the generator of this group, which is just the, the infinitesimal shift, which is just the functional derivative of the action, which means this is the field equation. So you have the equation of motion as generator, and so if the equation of motion is satisfied, you know that this uh, operator is equal to one. So the formula becomes even simpler, and this is now the basis of a proposal done recently by Detlef Buchholz and myself. Namely, instead of using canonical quantization in the traditional way, you can define your theory the following way. You say you have an algebra which is uh, generated by unitaries S of f, where f is a compactly supported local functional, S of zero should be the should be one, and the unitaries have to satisfy two relations. One is this causal factorization, which I already mentioned, and the uh, and the other is this condition, which I uh, derived before, namely that S of f is equal to S of f shifted plus this change of the uh, Lagrangian. Okay, now I would like to see consequences of this. And um, I have a question. I have a yeah. question. Uh, you said unitary is unitary in what sense? So is it operator this S of F? Or yeah, so, so um, okay. So the, the, First of all, this is uh, this is an algebra with an with a star operation, with an involution. So, a unitary element of such an algebra is just an element which has the property that s of f times s of f star is equal to one. So these are algebras generated by unitaries. So you take linear combinations and all products which you can form. And you have this relation that S of F times S of F star is always uh, equal to one. And uh, if you take and that star is an evolution, antilinear, and uh, if you apply the evolution twice, you get the original uh, original um, element. So it is in this sense Thank you. It's not really important that you have the Hilbert space, but. Uh, you can always treat them as operators on the Hilbert space, but uh, he, here at the moment, these are abstract elements of an algebra. Okay, now uh, I will describe the perturbative approach to algebraic quantum field theory. And um, it starts from the assumption that these unitaries 
are different. Uh, this uh, map from the functionals to this unitaries is differentiable to all orders. And then from this relation, you get certain uh, certain uh, relations for the for the derivatives. And this, at the end, really leads to a construction. So this I will uh, try to describe in more detail. So first of all, we look at this dynamical equation. Take this uh, derivative with respect to lambda. And we see that this is the same as the derivative when you insert here, instead of this uh, finite shift, the infinitesimal shift multiplied by lambda plus the corresponding uh, shift in, in f. So here's f prime should be the derivative of f. And this is now the derivative of this sum uh, in the direction of psi. And when you compare this with the bogle yubo formula, you would multiply this from the left-hand side with s of f to the minus 1. Then this is, the, this is just the definition of the interacting field and this is zero, so this is just the interacting field equation. Uh, here, this is the uh, uh, field equation with respect to the original Lagrangian, and this is the contribution coming from the additional interaction. So this is known in uh, kind of field theory as the Schwinger-Dyson equation. Yeah, so, so this uh, dynamical equation is an integrated version of the Schwinger-Dyson equation, which is formulated completely in terms of unitaries, and so you don't need to take these derivatives. The, the other observation is when you look at this causal factorization and take derivatives, and I do this for the uh, case where this intermediate interaction capital G is equal to zero, then you take the n plus mth derivative of the S matrix, evaluated at zero, and, ever, uh, and this is the direction n times in the direction of f, m times in the direction of h. f and h are causally separated in the way I described it before. And then this factorization equation just tells you that also these derivatives factorize in this way. So we get the nth derivative applied to the nth power of f, and the mth derivative applied to the mth uh, power of h. Now, the nice aspect of this formula is that the higher derivatives can be constructed from the lower derivatives. Yeah, because the zero, zero, uh, here in zero order, you always have one. So this you already know from the beginning. So when you have the first order, you can inductively try to construct the higher orders, but unfortunately not everywhere, because you have always the support restrictions. Yeah? So F and H must be separated by Cauchy surface. So when, but of course the Cauchy surface can be arbitrary, and you can of course use this factorization equation to uh, reduce the support of these functions to uh, arbitrarily small regions. So at the end, you can determine everything up to coinciding points from this, just from this formula. And this is the starting point for uh, epstein glaser renormalization. So um, you you define the first order as the first order derivative applied to some functional capital F just as a normal ordered uh, functional F corresponding to this uh, so just a normal ordering in the usual sense. So in epstein glaser they just start from the free Lagrangian and takes a normal ordering in Fox space. We see this as an initial point and then and by an inductive construction, you can get the higher derivatives. There are two steps. One step is that you use this causal factorization. This produces everything up to coinciding points. And then it remains a problem 
of extending a distribution in several variables to coinciding points. This is a mathematical problem which was completely solved in this Epstein-Glaser paper and uh, corresponds in other frameworks to renormalization. And this extension of these distributions is in general not unique, but it can be classified. And this classification then involves the renormalization group in the original sense of uh, stuckelberg petermann this is the content of the main theorem of renormalization theory by Stora Popinot. Actually, this paper of Stora Popinot has an interesting history. It was not published. It was a preprint, and for some reason, it never was published. It was uh, Raymond once told me the story because uh, this student, I think, this was a student of him, and he gave up after some time. And this was thought to appear in some proceedings, and these proceedings did not appear. So this remained a preprint up to recently. So only after the more died a few years ago, uh, colleagues uh, started to uh, um, had uh, took the initiative to publish this preprint. So after uh, I don't know, man, thirty years or so. Okay, now I will describe this in a little bit more detail. And um, this, if you want to see more details, I think I can recommend two textbooks. One is this textbook by Kasia Reisner, which is more mathematically inclined. And then there is a textbook by Michael Dutsch, where a lot of uh, explicit computations are performed. So, as before, uh, E is the space of smooth field configurations. We have functionals with suitable smoothness properties, which I don't want to describe in detail, just as a, I mentioned that these functionals uh, can be uh, differentiated with respect to the field configurations. So, this is some, needs some concepts of analysis on, uh, on uh, Trichet spaces. And um, then these derivatives are generically distributions. And these distributions uh, have certain singularities. They can be classified by the wavefront sets. And um, this microcausal uh, refers to certain properties of the wavefront set related to the space-time metric. I uh, don't want to treat the details here because this uh, will distract us too much. And moreover, these functions should have compact support. Then there's a certain subset of functionals. These are the local functionals. They are just of this form that you have an integral over the jet space. And, and uh, so F is a function on the jet space, and you insert now the field, the jet of the field in this function. So this is a possible interaction. And then I have to, uh, first to, to define normal ordering. Now this is a little bit tricky because um, as we already saw from this uh, uh, formalism of canonical quantization, you have a local functional which is not linear in the field then you you need to multiply distributions, which is in general not, not possible. And uh, for Fox space operators, we know how to do it using normal ordering. And one can define an abstract version of this normal ordering, which becomes important when you treat uh, quantum field theory and curved space sum, because there, there is no distinguished Fock representation. And this is the following formula. So first, we take a uh, functional f, where all these functional derivatives are smooth functions. Then we have here the exponential of a differential operator. So this is to be understood as a formal power series. So h bar is a formal expansion parameter here. And so this is just a formal power series of derivatives of these original 
functional f. This I call the normal ordered functional with respect to h. What is h? h is the so-called Hadamard solution of the free equations of motion, and it is uh, uh, has to select the positive frequencies in the commutator function. And the standard example, which is the basis for normal ordering in Fox space, is the Weitman two-point function. But uh, here it is not important that you take exactly the Weitman two-point function because uh, it's only important that it has the same singularities. For instance, you can take the two-point function of a KMS state, or you can, on curved space time, uh, there's a large class of uh, functions which you can use, and there's no, no one distinguished among them. So this normal ordering depends on the choice of H, but different choices of H are almost equivalent in the following sense. So if I have two um, such Hadamard functions, then the difference is a smooth function. And then the normal ordering with respect to H and the normal ordering with respect to H prime are related by this formula. Yeah, so you apply this difference, which is a smooth function, and here you take derivatives of f, which in general take, uh, gives distributions, but you ever write this distribution now with a smooth function. This, so this is well defined. So this is a well defined power series on the right hand side, and so you define your normal ordered local functionals to be or the no, normal ordered functions to be the normal, uh, the, uh, these normal ordered objects where f is just some functional and you insert this, this uh, Hadamard function h. And the important thing is that this set a is independent of h because of this formula. So the, these are abstract objects, so if you would write them in a concrete way for, say, object like phi squared, you have to subtract some infinities. So in this sense, this is a formal object, but you can just uh, uh, just uh, do computations with them. Then you define products of normal ordered functionals just by this formula. So you have a certain product, which is called a star product because it is uh, related to deformation quantization. And this is defined now in terms of an other star product which acts directly on the functionals f and g, and which involves this Hadamard function h. And this is given by this formula. So you apply again this differential operator now to this product of f and g at different field configurations, and at the end you identify all these field configurations. So this is uh, just formulas which are well known in deformation quantization. And um, the, but the, what is important is that the star product in the algebra A is independent of the choice of H. Yeah, the, this is a star product which depends on H, but this star product does not depend on H. And so you, what you get is an associative algebra of formal power series. Now, to describe now the derivative of the S matrix. Yeah. Um, can you go one back, one slide? Yes, so, so why does the star product not depend on H was one question. The other question, this formula reminds me of the Moyal formula where H would be like the bivector. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is such as uh, like, the, like the Moyal product. If you uh, actually, okay. To, to be more precise, uh, the Moyal product would correspond to the situation where you replace H by the commutator function. This look, this would give the Moyal by uh, the, the Moyal product. The problem, so the commutator function is anti-symmetric, so this is just uh, the symplect, uh, just the symplectic form you use in the Moyal product. But then this product would be ill-defined if 
f and g are local functionals because this would involve to when you take say second order term you would get the square of h but when you look at the commutator function so if you would work at equal times you get get something like the delta function so you would get the square of the delta function but uh, also when you take the commutator function as a uh, distribution in, in um, on four dimensional space you you the square is ill defined but by the choice of h i think this is the uh, reason why this uh, choice of h with these positive frequencies i mentioned here is so important because the positive positivity condition just tells you that the the singularities uh, are just in the good position yeah so so there's a criterion when distributions can be multiplied in terms of the wave front sets so if the vectors in the wave front sets can never add to zero then the product is well defined now here the the wave front set is in the positive light cone so if you add two vectors in the positive light cone you never can get zero but when you have also the negative frequencies you would also have vectors in the backward light cone and then the combination can give zero and so so uh, it's really important that this h is formed uh, by uh, requiring that only the positive frequencies contribute to the uh, to the singularities. Of course, this involves uh, details of microlocal analysis. I think that's uh, uh, what I say. M maybe one can uh, understand it in in, in Minkowski space. So you just take Fourier transform, and the pointwise product then corresponds to the convolution. And in the convolution, you have to integrate, and you just see when the when you have these positivity conditions, and you integrate over a compact uh, part of Minkowski space. And if you lose this com positivity condition, you have to integrate over um, all space time, and so you get the convolution is not no longer well defined. Yeah, so, so uh, for instance, when you take the Weitman function, delta plus, and you take this, its square and compute it in in uh, in, uh, uh, in Fourier space, yeah, then you have to add two two vectors on the positive mass shell, and this always remains. So, so if your sum of these two vectors is somewhere in the forward mass shell then the, integ uh, the integral goes only over a compact region. Those so what what uh, experimentalists call the phase space for two-particle scattering situation. Yes, so, so um, I hope my, my remarks are understandable. Of course, I could try to, to draw a picture. Maybe I can try to draw a picture here. Yeah, I think I got it roughly. Yeah, okay. So you have two, you add two vectors. You fix the sum, and you integrate over this other vector here. And but the, the region in which this vector can vary is 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 a compact region. Yeah, in the convolution, yeah, you have to always to add two arguments, and and uh, and you, uh, the result. This is the. Uh, um, the convolution, the, the, the convolution at a certain argument, and the argument is the sum of the arguments in the two factors. And uh, and if they are restricted to the forward light cone, this is only a compact region, in which this can, in which this variable can can uh, 
uh, can be changed. Th this is behind this, this condition. Yeah, of course, one has to uh, uh, work out this in detail, uh, but um, at the end, it's, it's not more than this. So in a sense, it's a little bit strange that this was invented by mathematicians and not by physicists. So, it's, uh, so from the point of physics, it's very natural, but it's a theorem of Hermann that. But maybe physicists observed it long before them without making uh, any, any general statement about it. Okay, now I come to the time order product. And <clears throat> so what is a time ordered product? The time ordered product is a commutative product on a certain subspace of A. It's not the full algebra, but a large part of A, containing in, in particular the local functionals. And it has the property because of this causal factorization that it coincides with the star product provided the supports are causally separated. And I explain it here in a simple example. So we have uh, two functionals, in a sense, the most simple non-trivial functionals. So these are square uh, quadratic functionals in phi with two different densities, f and g. And we use this uh, same formalism as before. So the time order product so this normal ordered uh, expression is defined in terms of the of a h dependent time order product of the original functional and then again normal ordered and then um, this time order product depending on h is defined in the following way so you have just the pointless product you have the terms in first order h bar, but you just uh, get a sum distribution h index f, which is version of the Feynman propagator associated to this uh, function capital H, and evaluated with these uh, with these test functions. So phi multiplied by f is a test function, and phi multiplied by g is also a test function. And then you have a term of second order in h bar, which is a new distribution, h f squared, and uh, evaluated with the test function f tensor g. Now, what is this uh, Feynman uh, propagator? This is just the Hadamard function multiplied by the Heaviside function in time, plus the uh, Heaviside, uh, the uh, Hadamard function with reverse arguments, the, oh, this is a, this is a, um, this is wrong. This should be t prime minus t here. So the other time uh, orientation. So this comes just from the, from the original causal separation. And the same for the, for the uh, second uh, order contribution, where you take just the square of h, which is well defined for the reasons I explained before. And here again, you have this, and again, I made here an error. This should be t prime minus t. Now, the, uh, you see immediately what the problem is. You multiply a distribution, h, by a discontinuous function. So this is well defined. Again, you can look at these uh, wave front sets, and you see here there's no problem, because the Hadamard function uh, has a singularity which are light-like, and, and this is a, and the the uh, heavy set function of t has of course a singularity which is time-like, but it's impossible to form zero by a sum of a time-like and a and a light-like vector. So this is the the Feynman propagator itself is well defined for any Hadamard function, but this is no longer true for the square because the square of the Hadamard function, in the square you sum vectors in the light-like uh, light vectors, but the sum of two 
positive light like vectors can be arbitrary positive, uh, uh, arbitrary vector in the positive light ball. And then you can, of course, have combinations uh, of vectors in the wavefronts uh, T and wavefronts uh, T here, which go to zero. So this is in general no, no longer valid, uh, no longer uh, no longer well defined. But the choice of the time variable was completely arbitrary, and uh, this function H is symmetric at uh, space-like separated arguments x and y. So uh, the only problem is the, uh, is at coinciding points. And this is a generic feature, I think, here I explained it here in the simplest example, but this repeats to, to every order. And so, so this... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, one question, why are there no cross terms? If I no. multiply, so naively multiply HF and take HF squared, I would get cross terms, wouldn't I? So I wonder why these are not occurring in the definition of HF squared. Yeah. Uh, what in the next line, the, in the next line, there's the definition of HF. Yeah. And yeah, this is the definition of HF squared. Yeah. And if I take the, the above definition of HF and naively square it, I get cross terms. I get. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this would be, uh, of course. Okay. So two two comments. First of all. This, this square here is only uh, symbolic, yeah? so, so this is not well-defined. You cannot, you cannot take the square of this object. This is not well-defined. Uh, the square of H is well-defined, but not the square of HF. Formally, it's so when you take the cross terms, then here, of course, here, I, I, unfortunately, I made this typo, so this is T prime minus T. So if I multiply this heavy side function for different <laughs> For different signs, I get zero. Yeah, so so the cross term is just zero. Of course, you can say, well, uh, at at t equal t prime, yeah, there can be a problem. Actually, there is a problem, but the problem is already when you use this formula. Yes. So this is uh, so this is defined for x uh, different from y, but. Uh, to, to, to extend it to all space, you need to extend this distribution, and this amounts to renormalization. But this is well understood, so this can be done, and, and uh, you know that it's uh, not unique, and you can classify all extensions and so on. And this is just the ordinary uh, thing that you do in uh, renormalization theory. This is a simple loop graph here. Yeah? So this is, uh, uh, let me see. So this would be such a graph here, yeah? So thank you. Yeah, and, and, and uh, so, so th this has a certain singularity in four dimensions, and, and then you, you can classify these singularities and just see the result. Okay. Now you need to define the... the uh, the S matrix, just as the exponential series, is a time ordered product. And you have to insert here now a normal ordered local functional. And here I use the index mu for the following reasons. Of course, I could use any Hadamard function H. The problem is that then I would get problems with this condition of local covariance. So if I compare then the, the uh, S matrices in different space times, would embed one space times into another, then I would have the problem that the Hadamard functions on different space times should be related in some way. And this turns out to be a problem 
And what one here uses is uh, some normal ordering, which is uh, agrees with this concept of local covariance. So in the sense of category theory, it's a natural transformation between two functors. And this depends on the choice of the Hadamard function, but you uh, replace here the Hadamard function by the asymptotic expansion which you get when you define the Hadamard function explicitly. So you get there's a certain formula by which you, you uh, ex uh, get the contribution to this Hadamard function. And the terms of this expansion are unique up to the choice of a mass scale. In general, this expansion does not converge. But when you have a local functional, uh, then uh, you you see only the derivatives of this function at coinciding points, and uh, so so and they are well defined by this by this expansion. So you can make this uh, this definition almost almost uh, independent, uh, almost unique. The only thing is what enters is the choice of mu, and mu is a sum mass scale, which can be uh, taken universal. So it does not depend on the choice of your space time. So this is a covariant definition of the S matrix, which, for instance, is important also on Minkowski space when you, for instance, try to define the, the theory at uh, finite temperature. Then you have a different two-point function, and uh, it's important that you are able to compare the theories at different temperatures. So it's good to have some uh, some um, choice of this normal ordering, which um, which is independent of the choice of your state or of your two-point function. But um, mu is um, yeah. So so it remains this dependence on the mass scale. So this holds in dimension four for a scalar field. So in other theories, you have other restrictions. So in principle, you could have more uh, parameters here. But um, in this simple case, you have only one parameter. Yeah, I think I stop here for today and will explain more tomorrow. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, then we can take questions. The questions from here, from the lecture hall. Uh, I do not remember what were the functors f log and r log, and what you mean by this natural transformation in this context. Yeah. Um, so, so we have this um, um, so you have this normal ordering, yeah. So, so we have. An, uh, let me try to write it here. So you have this map. To, to, uh, to to this uh, to this um, <clears throat> um, to, to this normal ordered expression. Yeah. Now you you can. Um, you can now, um, so, so this is uh, a functional on, say, F. Ah. <laughs> of some, ah. <laughs> 
so you <laughs> have some some space of functionals. So these are the local functionals, and they contain some f, and you map them to some element of this uh, algebra A. Now you can then embed the manifold M into an other manifold, and this corresponds then to some local functional on on uh, uh, on other space M N, and you can here again, so so then then you can. Uh, map this functional to, to the space of these functionals, normal order it here, and, and uh, you can also embed the, this on the side of the algebra, A. You can also end, yeah, you have a similar, similar map here. So this would be now the, the A. Uh, okay, so, 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 yeah, so, so you have M is embedded in N, then the corresponding functionals are embedded into each other, and the same holds for this algebra. Now you do normal ordering here, and you do normal ordering here. The question is whether this is commutative. Yeah, so, 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 um, so, so you you want to have something which is defined uh, independent of the question whether your space time is considered to be part of a larger space time. This holds for all this construction, also for the for the renormalization. When you do the renormalization, so you define the higher order time uh, time ordered product, then you also have to do this in such a way that it's compatible with these uh, with these. Uh, um, functor relating space times to each other. Okay, you have inclusions of space times and you have associated uh, inclusions of these different spaces you can, can perform here. The principle of local covariance says that all this has to be uh, in agreement with these different embeddings. Yeah, so, so natural in the mathematical sense seems to be very natural from the physics sense. Thank you. <laughs>